Hi, I'm Chris Joseph. My definition of relentless is just never giving up. Life's going to knock you down, getting back up. It's not always about you know, how you how you fell or why you fell, but getting back up is uh, is the key. And you may not get to where you want to go, but uh, just getting back up and dusting off and trying again. On today's episode of the Relentless Podcast, join me and a very good friend of mine, Chris Joseph, as we talk about grief. We talk about the the depths of it and, and what happens when you're grieving the loss of somebody very significant in your life. We are very hopeful that this podcast will be helpful to others dealing with grief on any level, and in particular, parents who have lost children. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Relentless Podcast. My name is Kyle Dubay, and on today's episode, uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a unique episode of the Relentless Podcast. Uh, if you've been listening to some of the episodes, you know that what we try to do is bring people on who have uh, maybe had a relentless journey in their lives, or, or they've had to be relentless in some way to get to where they are. I'm also a big believer that um, there are relentless pressures in our lives that we have to deal with. And on today's episode, that's what we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about the relentless pressure of grief. Um, I'm, I'm very happy and, uh, and, and excited to have a, a very good friend of mine, Chris Joseph here. And on today's episode, um, Normally, I host and I interview. I let the other person do a lot of talking. I, some of you probably think I talk too much. But on today's episode, um, Chris and I are going to talk about grief from a father's perspective. And um, because both of us are fathers who have lost sons. And we're going to talk about that. So, Chris, welcome to the Relentless Podcast. It's good to see you, my friend. Thanks, Kyle. It's always good to see you. Yeah. So, Chris, you and I have talked a bit about doing this podcast. Yep. We've talked about why we um, thought we should do this podcast, and I'll just maybe explain it a little bit, and you can jump in any time. Sure. Um, Chris and I have talked many times about about grief, and, and we'll explain uh, our losses momentarily, but we are kind of believers that grief is not talked about enough. Yep, and that there's a uh, almost an education element uh, that should be explored when it comes to grief. And we really felt that if if two dads could get together and be vulnerable and talk about our journeys, um, maybe it would help others. Maybe it would help other men. Yeah, but just For others sure. in general. Yeah. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, I think it's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, but Chris and I have spent a lot of time together in the last almost two years. Um, and essentially, as we've gotten together so many times and had what I call Chris and Kyle talks, um, I think what we're going to do today is allow the listeners in on. They're going to fly on the wall of yeah. one of our talks. One of our talks. Yeah. So, Chris, um, let's give you the mic a little bit. Um, why don't you talk to us uh, about about your loss. I think that's the way we'll start this. Okay. So we'll talk about our losses and then we'll go into our journeys if that's okay. Okay. So, um, uh, for the listeners anyways. Um, so my, I, we lost our 20 year old son on April 6th of 2018. He was a member of the Humboldt Broncos hockey team that was involved in a bus crash in Saskatchewan. Um, and I don't know how detail you want me to go into, but, uh, Clearly, it's a, a day that changed our lives. Um, we were preparing to get ready to watch his game that night. Uh, they were traveling from Humboldt to Nippon, and they were going to play game uh, game five of the playoffs. They were down three to one, and um, we were getting ready to watch a game. And uh, got a phone call from a friend of ours who you know um, had coached. Uh, Jackson throughout the years, he was a police officer and he told us that there was a, uh, the bus was involved in some sort of crash. And that was around six o'clock. 
crash happened at five o'clock. Uh, and, uh, so I think my first inclination was, you know, the bus went off, off the highway, you know, minor. Um, so I called Jackson right away and no answer. I called four more times, no answer. And then, uh, of course, you know, you start thinking some terrible thoughts, still know nothing. Um, we waited around, we called our daughter, uh, to come home. We called our son to come home. We don't know what's happening. We told them what we know. <clears throat> we reached out to lots of other parents that we knew another St. Albert family as well. Uh, they knew nothing as well. Their son was on the bus. Um, and we basically waited around for about an hour didn't know what we were doing, didn't have anything. We're starting to now hear reports uh, that it's bad. And my wife looks at me and she says, what are we doing here? And I said, yeah. And we jumped in a car and drove to Saskatchewan uh, with no destination in mind, really. We just started heading. Uh, my son-in-law, now my son-in-law, at the time my daughter's boyfriend, uh, was driving uh, because I couldn't drive. And I, I'm, I'm a firefighter, and I've always been sort of the calm, cool, collected one in emergencies at home. And uh, I asked him to drive because I literally hyperventilated from Edmonton to Lloydminster. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't catch my breath. And you, you know that you're hopeful that it's going to be okay. But the longer that it's not okay, my experience tells me it's not good. You know, like I'm, I'm phoning everybody, phoning the assistant coach that wasn't on the bus, phoning other parents that I know, nobody knows. And then we start hearing reports of fatalities. And uh, I mean, I could go on and on. I don't know how much of the whole thing you it's want up me to, to you, tell. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> well. We end up making it to Saskatoon about one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And, uh, well, I should probably back up, but Jackson's girlfriend, Quinn, uh, we called them. They live in Saskatoon. We start hearing reports that many, all the players are going to go to the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon, the ones that are coming in. The ones that are not coming in are not leaving the scene because they're deceased. We don't know how many there are. Um, by the time we get to um, the hospital, uh, we find out that there are no more coming in. There are 14 in the hospital. <clears throat> and there are, or there might be 15 in the hospital. I'm not sure of the numbers. Uh, we don't even know how many people are on the bus. So we get there, um, and Quinn's family is there to greet us. It's the first time we met them because they, had, Quinn and Jackson had only been dating a couple months. Uh, so we meet John and Leslie, and uh, um, they tell us that I told them that a coach had told me that Jackson was airlifted from the crash site to the hospital. I said, we're not going to be there for three more hours. Um, can I get Quinn to go identify him because he's not responsive. He's, they've got him, they put him in a coma. And, uh, so we're about an hour out and we get a call from John Quinn's dad. And he says, uh, Quinn went up to see Jackson She's pretty confident that's not him. And now, so we're like, well, there's nobody left. Everybody else has been identified. And turns out that wasn't him. That was another boy that they misidentified because they all, they're all six foot tall, blonde. Um, they all look the same. Yeah. And they were all banged up. Uh, so I get there 
and I said, I want to go see him. And this boy was, this was, this was Morgan, this boy, this wasn't Jackson, but I didn't know that. I said, I want to go see him. And Andrea says, my wife, she says, I, I can't go. So I'm going to take my daughter. So Taylor and I go up to see, which we thought was Jackson. I'm staring at him head to toe, literally head to toe. I'm looking at everything and I can't tell. And Taylor looks at me and she goes, dad, this is, this is Jackson. And I said, Taylor, I want to, I want to believe that too, but I, I don't know. I don't know. So I go back downstairs and I, I tell my wife, I said, I don't know. I don't know. It looks like him, but doesn't have a beard that he had. He's, uh, his haircut looks different. Did he get a haircut the other day? Andrea says, well, he had a bonded wire behind his teeth. Go check that. So I go back up, no bonded wire. And I'm just, I want to, I'm like, I'm looking through the eyes of hope. I knew I was. And my daughter, Taylor, is like, this is him. Anyways, um, there was a police officer there and he had shown us the clothing that they had taken off this boy. And there was a blue dress shirt. It's like, do you recognize? He goes, this dress shirt came off this boy. Do you recognize this blue uh, dress shirt? And I said, no. Um, so I'm in my head, I'm thinking this ain't him. It's not him. So we go back, talk to Andrea. We're sitting around. I start hearing rumors that three of the boys are downstairs and they're talking. And that was Derek, Nick, and Grayson. And so I'm like, I'm going to go talk to them. Not that they know anything either, but I'm going to go talk to them. So I go downstairs and I talk to Derek, Nick, and Grayson. First time I've ever met. Well, I think I may have maybe met him. And uh, I start asking about Jackson. I go, do you guys know where he was sitting? Do you know this? And they're like, we don't know. Sorry, we don't know anything. Like, we don't know. And at that time, that same police officer came down. And he had that blue t-shirt, that blue dress shirt. And he asked them, do you know whose dress shirt this is? And they all in unison said, that's Morgan's. And that was kind of my aha moment when I knew that that boy upstairs was not my son. And that my son wasn't coming in. And that he was laying on a cold Saskatchewan ground. Probably had a blanket over him. But he was not coming in, which meant he was gone. So then I had to come to terms with that. But I also had to tell my wife and my daughter, this is it. Like, it's, he's not coming in. We're not, we're not saving him. Because they ended up leaving 14 people on scene. Two died later in the hospital. But 14 were pronounced dead on the scene. So that was kind of my, my moment. And uh, from then on, it was waves and waves of different emotions, different feelings, learning to adjust to this new life and just being, just being there and going through everything. And that's when it all sort of began. And almost five years later, Kyle, I'm still there. Mm. I'm there in a different capacity. <clears throat> um, but I'm, I'm not healed. I'll never be healed. And I've, you just learn to live with it. I've smiled lots. I've laughed. I've shared lots of good memories. But I'm always going to be incomplete. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, you kinda, and I have talked about that's that. That's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget that day. Uh, it was it was a we had Tyler Smith on uh, recently, uh, which was one of the survivors of the crash. And I said the same thing to him. It's it's uh, there's moments in life and and you don't forget where you are. And, and I'll never forget that day. Um, I I knew of J- 
Jackson being on the team and I knew of Logan Hunter being on the team and uh, automatically, but again, nobody knew what was happening and, and um, yeah, I'll just never forget it. I remember exactly where I was. I remember all the, the social media feeds that we were just watching constantly. I remember contacting so many people that you and I are connected to through the hockey world and, and, um, and it was brutal. <clears throat> So for for me, um, almost two years to the day yeah. of you losing Jackson, um, April fifth, twenty twenty one. Actually, what I'll do is I'll go to April fourth, twenty twenty one. It was just a good day. It was Easter Sunday. Yeah, it was a good day. Uh, my in-laws were over. They probably shouldn't have been because it was during COVID, but we were having a visit with them. My one boy was in, my middle boy was in Regina uh, playing in the WHL in the bubble that was happening. My oldest boy and my youngest boy were home and we just had a good day. Yeah. It was a normal day. Uh, That day ended with... uh, I was just going to bed like normal. Uh, my oldest boy and my youngest boy have bedrooms downstairs, and it's a normal night. They were both playing video games until late at night. And then we woke up and just thought it was a, another normal day. And it turned out to be the, the worst day of our lives. Uh, I don't know if I'll have another worst day. Like I don't think I'll have a day that will compare. Um, my youngest son, Luke, uh, at some point in the, 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 the late night, early morning took his own life and I'm not going to go into all the details of all of it. Um, but it was the shock of a lifetime. It was, um, he had been having a, a, a couple few weeks of being down uh, around a couple circumstances that were going on in his life. But but truth be told, nothing to the point where there were massive red flags for us, where we thought he was suicidal yeah. or where we thought uh, he was going to harm himself. <clears throat> My line of work has led me to take um, suicide intervention training three or four times. Um I, 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 I'm not an expert, but I mean, I, I know signs. I, I know how to deal with some of this stuff. And it just wasn't there, in my opinion, with Luke. Um, he obviously had a darkness that, uh, and there was a depth to it that we didn't understand. We, we obviously didn't understand. We didn't see. And uh, that day, changed everything it changed everything and again i'm not going to go into big details about it but um it started me and uh and my wife and my two sons and this ripple effect of people uh on a journey on a path that truth be told has been so hard and difficult um and now here we are today. We're a couple of dads. Yep. Who, Almost two years and five years later. Yep. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and maybe what I want us to do is is just talk about <clears throat> our experience of grief and what does that look like. And, and I think the reason why we wanted to do this was so that, and we're going to explain in our own ways. And again, you ask me questions too, like this yeah. needs to be a back yeah. and forth, but but we're going to explain in our own ways how we've dealt with grief. Um, you would have found out about Luke, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't want to tell that story. If yeah. you, you would know better, but I think you found out on the six, the six, which yeah, was the next day for you. And that was the anniversary for us. The three year anniversary. Yep. And um, Luke's death, uh, it, it did uh, go out into our community uh, very quickly. Yeah. And 
I don't remember a lot of the first few days. The first probably, honest to goodness, like the first two weeks probably. There's yeah. just a lot missing for me. Yeah. But on the 7th of April, 2021, um, it was during COVID. It was, uh, um, <laughs> let's also say this, is that we're, we're, t- we're here to tell our stories. Mm-hmm. Chris's story, Kyle's story. I'm not here to tell my wife's story. Yeah. I don't think you're here to tell Andy's story. No. Um, I don't think you're here to tell Taylor and Brett's story. I'm not here to tell Liam and Jackson's story, my Jackson. Um, but we're going to, they'll be part of our story kind yeah. of a deal, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> in the beginning, um, because of COVID, uh, we, we ended up not having a service for Luke because we were only allowed to have 10 people or something and, and we chose not to. Um, but it almost turned into a two week, a one week for sure, almost a two week wake yeah. in my backyard. Um, weather was a little bit cold off and on, snowed a couple of days. So it was either in my garage or my backyard. Um, my wife was not coming out to see a lot of people. Um, but I almost took it upon myself where it was almost uh, the, the reception line at a funeral where people were just showing up and we can talk about that a little bit later as well, but you and Andy came over on the 7th, and my wife came out to see you guys. Um, and that conversation was, was I, I remember a lot of it. And that's the day that you and I, uh, not really not wanting to. Yeah. Became bonded. Yep, absolutely. And our relationship has been growing ever since. Our closeness has has just developed and developed and developed. And um, there were so, and there's things that I'll talk about later that you guys brought up. But you had talked to me about what what do you call it? The Ugly Shoe Club. Oh yeah, the Ugly right? Shoes Club. Yeah, the Ugly yeah. Shoes Club. Yeah. And how we're now part of this club. Club that nobody wants to be that in. That nobody wants to be in, yeah. right? Yeah. Maybe explain what that is. Well, I don't know exactly how to do it, but it's something along the lines of, you know, look at me, I wear these ugly shoes, and um, they have holes in them, and they're broken down, and every day, every day I wear them, and I don't have a choice, and people look at me, and they feel bad for me uh, that I have to wear these ugly shoes, um, but this is my life. It's something along you the can't lines take of them that, off. and you can't take them off. And uh, it's just this, and it's it's all about bereaved parents, right? Um, and we are we're a member of this shitty club that nobody wants to be in. Um, you didn't have a choice, and yet here we are, and we get each other. And I think that's the thing. And 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 our children died in very different ways. Mm-hmm. And there are some things that uh, we won't get about each other, but there are so many things that we do get. And, you know, the emotions and the feelings and the, the time frames and things like that. And so for, for Andy and I, when we found out on April 6th and we were doing a celebration for the Humboldt Broncos that, that day and we we knew we had to come see you guys. Um, and so we didn't come see you guys till the next day because I think Andy wanted to get a card or something like that. Um, but I just, for us, we remember those first few days, and I still do, and you do too. Mm-hmm. But at the time for you, you were you were in it. You didn't know what those first few days were going to be like. You thought your life was over. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I didn't want to come over and preach and tell you, this is what you're going to feel. This is what it's like, but I knew you needed somebody and you had people, Yeah. but I knew you needed somebody that would just be there Mm -hmm. and listen. Um, and I think it's, I think it's, I just, God, man, those first days, they're just pain. They're brutal. They're just nothing but pain. 
it, it, it's it's almost impossible to describe. Yeah. And and this is the way that that I describe it, Chris. And uh, this analogy just came to me a little while ago. Um, and just so so people know, like we're we're recording this, and and we're close to the five year mark for for Chris's journey and the two year mark for mine. Um, and this is still very raw for both of us. So, um, but anyways, the the, the way that that I I looked at those those first th- days is it's kind of like when you watch a movie. And there's a scene where um, a bomb goes off and, and that character in the movie is close to the bomb and they go down and that ringing buzzing noise, ears, that yeah. ringing in the ears <clears throat> and it's chaotic and it's confusing and you're trying to figure out where you are, what you're yeah. doing, what's happened. That to me is from the moment I heard I'm going to say the first week, even two weeks, like that's what it was yeah. to me. Yeah. It, it was chaos. And then there were, there were yeah. certain parts that were calm and, yeah. but it was confusing and it was, you feel disorientated. You feel lost. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally. You are lost. You went from a life that you knew to an altered life. Now um, you still have a life. You still have children. Um, but nothing is as it should be. Right. Everything changed. And, um, you know, your, your kitchen table with, you know, where five people sat now, four people are sitting. Uh, just whatever it is, like everything. First, okay, so first of all, for me, and I, and I don't want to say for you, but the first thing that, really hit me was just the pain of the loss for me, just me. I didn't give two shits about anybody else's loss. Right. And I know that I should have, I should have cared about Andrea's loss and Taylor's loss and Brett's loss and grandma and grandpa and everybody else. But I was so focused on my own loss of my boy that I was so wrapped up in myself. You come to realize that, the rest of your family is doing the same damn thing. Mm-hmm. Everybody's wrapped up in their own loss. They're all, they're all, you know, mourning their relationship loss and the pain that they're in. And so you're just so wrapped up in yourself. But, but we've learned that that's because grief is selfish. Grief is selfish. And that's okay. Yep. And um, when I say we, I'm talking about you and I, mm-hmm. we've learned that, you know, the, 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 you were a family of five. We were a family of five. Um, so now the four of you and the four of us, we're in it together, yep. yet we're in it alone. Yeah. Because of that, we all deal with it differently. Mm-hmm. There are certain things that my wife can do that I still can't do yep. and vice versa. Yep. Um, my boys are handling it the way that – differently yep. than us. Um, so that – selfishness in our grief it makes sense well and i told you this but i do recall a time when we were so we're about three months in we're at the lake in the summer we i took time off work um so we're at the lake in the summer in a soyuz and we're getting in the car and we're going to go somewhere i don't even know where the hell we were going but there's a four of us in the car me my wife and my two kids and we got in this big fight in the car because I couldn't even tell you who it was, but somebody was sad. Somebody was having a good day. Somebody was indifferent and somebody was mad Mm. out of the four of us. And it was all in relation to losing our, our, our Jackson. Yeah. Right. And I remember somebody saying something like, you know, why you got to be so freaking happy today? Like today's a shit day. And, it dawned on me then how grief is selfish. Everybody's mourning their loss of their relationship. But at that same moment in the car, all four of us were having different emotions and we were all on a different journey on that same day, that same car. And I said, I, I went full dad mode. I yelled at everybody in the car. I said, <laughs> listen, we need to respect that mom is here. Taylor's here. 
Brett's here and dad's here and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with us all being in different places yeah. at the same time because tomorrow the whole thing could be switched up. You could be sad. You could be happy. You could be mad. You could be indifferent. You could be all those. And so I think we learned as a family for us that, yep, grief is selfish, but everybody's going to experience different things on different days. And there's no timeline that's mm -hmm. set in stone. And you just have to respect the fact that they're feeling that way today. Let's say somebody's having a great day and you're having a terrible day. Why, why should you ruin their great day? Right. They're having one rare good ones. Yep. You know? So yeah, I'm down. I'm, I'm feeling mopey. Right. Um, so I don't want to rain on their parade today because they're having the one good day in six months, you know, but they've also got to respect the fact that, you know, dad's having a tough day. Sure. So, and that's, that's kind of one of the things that we learned in the selfishness of the grief. I, I don't know if the four of us have ever been on the same wavelength together yeah. in a day since Luke died. No. Um, because like what you just said, there's somebody happy, there's somebody sad, yep. there's somebody angry, there's somebody. Yep. Now there might've been three. Yeah. Three and one. One. Yeah. But I honestly don't know. Uh, maybe there has been. And I yep. just haven't noticed. Um, the 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 point of us talking about this as well is that is that we do hope that people uh, who are listening, if they've experienced grief um, at any level, but in particular at this deep level of, of losing a child, um, that they're not going to feel alone. What I've learned, uh, and I, I think, well, I know you have, is that grief is very isolating. So everything that we just talked about in regards to we're in it together, yet we're in it alone, it's very isolating. Mm -hmm. And you have brought wisdom into my life, and I'm very, very thankful uh, that you were open enough through your grief to come in share with me your experiences uh, in, in such a way that was gentle and compassionate, but it has shown me that I'm not alone. Yeah. That being said, you and I don't talk every day. Yeah. You and I can't hang out 24 um, seven. It's just, it's not the way it, it can happen. Yeah. Um, and there are moments of just pure isolation. Yeah. Because who do you talk to? Who do you not talk to, yeah. right? Um, and at times, let's call it what it is. Our wives, we're very lucky guys. Yeah, We have incredible wives. They're beautiful inside and out. They're awesome. They're fun. They're great. But at the end of the day, uh, you don't always want to talk to them. No. Um, my boys, to be honest with you, are not interested in talking to me about their grief. And I wonder if that's a protective thing, right, where they know mom and dad are fragile. Yeah. Or maybe they're just boys at that age that don't want to talk to me yeah. about anything. But it's lonely. It is. And, and and after the first three months, after the first six months, nine months, it's all these stages. You talked about this. Mm -hmm. um, it, when this first happened for you guys, when this first happened with us, there was these amazing communities around us. Just a ton of people. And then very naturally... Nothing I can ever be upset about. Yep. The world kept turning. Kept turning. Yep. Yours stopped. Yep. Mine stopped. Yep. And it's tough to deal with that, isn't it? It is. And that's why um, one of the things we talked about, and so I'm three years ahead of you in my journey, and I talked about how the first year I was absolutely numb. Yep. Second year, I'm like, it's going to get better. And it didn't. It got worse. Um, and it got worse because reality set in harder. The third year for us, we did heavy counseling and it did get better, but it only got minimally better, mm -hmm. right? Like, but it got better. I could get through my day to day. Um, and then year four and year five now, I'd say minimally better, but it's always there mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's always been there. 
uh, and it always will be. And the longer I go on with my journey, I realize that this is forever. This is literally forever. I will, I'll be that, hopefully, I'll be that 95-year-old dad on my deathbed that when you ask me, you know, what's your greatest regret in life? And I'll be like, no question. No question. It'll be losing my child. Mm -hmm. And that'll be, uh, this is with me forever. Like I will regret making decisions and work and I'll regret making decisions. I didn't go visit somebody and I'll regret making investment decisions or whatever it is, but nothing, nothing compares to this. And if I am lucky enough to be a 96 year old man on my deathbed and they ask me that this is going to be my answer. It's losing a child. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, there's nothing harder. And then, you know, we talked about the, the kids and, I, I look at all four of us and I don't want to assume the Dubé family is the same way, but I look at all four of us and I lost me personally. I lost my boy. That was part of me. I lost, um, my little hockey player that I coached my, my buddy that I would joke around with. Uh, we'd go watch Oilers games together. So that's what I lost and so much more. Uh, and then I think how it's different for them. Mm. Andrea lost somebody that was literally inside of her for yeah. nine months. Like mums, it's different. We've it's talked the about same, this. but it's different. No, it's it's there's they, there's some similarities, but you and I have spoken of this. They carried them. It's it's they are physically part of them. Yeah, yeah, physically part of them. And then the the other side to that too is we talk about our kids. And I would never diminish that it's not, I don't want to ever compete. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not the same. Comparing is tough, right? Yeah. It is. But they lost a sibling. Right. And I never lost a sibling. You don't understand. What I don't know what that's through. like. Right. They never lost a child. Right. And so it's different, but it's the same person. Yeah. So we're all in this shit together. Right. But that's yeah. again, where it goes back to in it together, but in it alone, because yeah. I can't understand what my other two boys are experiencing yeah. because I haven't lost a brother. I can't understand what my wife is going through yeah. fully yeah. because of the fact that motherhood is different than fatherhood. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love... <sighs> I do strongly agree that we all lost a part of ourselves. 100%. You know, I, 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 early on... The analogy was given that it's 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 almost as though if you lost a hand or an mm -hmm. arm or a leg and and you have to somehow adapt your life mm -hmm. to live without that. Um, at the time, that made a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. because I nothing was making sense to me. Um, you know the 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 ways that our boys died are very different, and mm -hmm. and you actually acknowledged that immediately with me. Mm -hmm. You were so generous and, and gracious in saying, Kyle, I'm not going to understand everything you're going through. Um, we talked about anger. You said, I don't know where you're going to put your anger, Kyle. At the time, mm -hmm. you put your anger towards the truck driver. I had a villain. It was easy for me to put my anger towards somebody. Yeah. Or multiple people. Sure. You guys didn't. In an in industry. Um. If I'm going to be a thousand percent honest, which I have been with you over the time, and, and I don't want to go into hardcore details about it, but my anger does go towards Luke sometimes. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's super hard. It is. <clears throat> because I, I, there, there's no, there's, like you said, there's no villain. That I, I don't have an answer. No. Um, we will spend our entire lives wondering why yep. there weren't massive red flags. Um, yet <clears throat> what you said earlier is, is the way that I've explained it to many people as well is that moving forward in life uh, we do feel incomplete mm -hmm. you talked about the, the kitchen table the, probably the hardest times that I have uh, see now I get fidgety eh, when I start yeah, doing this yeah, I start yeah. playing with the paper <laughs> yeah. um I struggle deeply when it's just the four of us having supper together. Yeah. It's so hard for me because it is glaring that Luke is not sitting in his seat. Yep. And everybody notices it. 
Everybody knows it. And so I just kind of get through it, and then I usually hit the garage. I'm a smoker, so I go have a couple darts, and I just weep. We don't eat a lot together because people are out doing their things, and my boys yeah. are older. And um, But that, to me, is one of the worst things. It's just glaring. Yeah. It's yep. glaring. Family photos. Do you know that we've only ever done that once and, and uh it was it was shortly after Luke died, my middle boy Jacks graduated high school and we had to do a family. Yeah. I say we had to, I mean Well, you kinda want to, but yeah. you kinda don't. It was it was awful. Yeah. It was awful. Yeah. Like it was just and and these are things that that and and we're actually going to do kind of a second half to this podcast yeah. because we're going to talk about supporting people who are grieving. But these are the things that, um, you know what, Chris, after Jackson died, <clears throat> I, uh, knowing you guys, not super well, but well enough, we had spent a lot of time together mm-hmm. in sports and having fun and partying a bit and yeah. doing parent parties and all that type of stuff. I remember, um, I've been honest with you about this. I actually avoided Andrea. Yeah. I didn't avoid you. Um, every time I saw you, I made sure that, and you're, you're a hugger anyways, but like it made I sure we used hugged. to be. Yeah. Well, yeah. you became one. Yeah. And, um, uh, I got involved with that Humboldt, uh, the hockey tournament yep. that the St. Albert boys did. <clears throat> Just a behind the scenes thing helped all these amazing young guys who wanted to to play some hockey for the boys, right? Yep. And uh, I was just so impressed with with you being there and, and showing your support to it. But I remember distinctly there was a night where everyone kind of went out and it was just one of the local establishments and all the players were there and, and some of the families came and you and Andrea were there. And I, I talked to you, and I think I gave Andy a quick hug, but I just avoided her. Yeah. I just couldn't. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. And I, what I realized on April 5th, 2021, is that I had had some grief in my life. I've lost some, some grandparents, mm-hmm. uh, a couple other people in my life, uh, a friend when I was young uh, who, who died of cancer. But that whole concept of like the world keeps moving, yep. that was me. Yeah. <clears throat> and when it came to you guys, it 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 was almost as though, okay, if I avoid them, then my world can keep moving. Yep. On April 5th, I felt like I finally met grief. I think I grief was an, uh, an acquaintance. Yeah. I think it is for everybody until they. I, I, I listen. We're going to talk about this later. Yeah. Everybody's going to deal with grief. Yeah. But for me, it was an acquaintance. Yeah. And on April fifth, twenty twenty one, it became embedded into my being. Yeah. Yeah. I think nobody knows until you know. Right. Like anything. Yeah. If you were to say, you don't know what it's like to not be the most important person in the world until you have children. Right. Like just, we all have that sort of, you know, like single people are selfish or whatever. Right. Um, But you think about all the people that lost loved ones prior to us and how did you react? Did you avoid them? Did you send a quick condolence? And, and, you know, now that you look back on it and we remember the people that, that left you know, nice messages or were there for us and the, some that weren't. Mm-hmm. And um, for me personally, I mean, I had some people that surprised me with how much they were there. I had some people surprise me with how much they weren't there. And I really, I try not to get butt hurt, butt hurt about the ones that weren't. Because, sure. <clears throat> because we've all got different reasons for doing what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, So for me personally, I found the people that acknowledged it um, right away was huge. Even if they just sent a text, sure. You know, like that meant a lot. Um, They didn't have to be there all the time because 
you know, I'm going to be with my four or five close ones. Yeah. But the people that acknowledged it right away just said, I'm sorry for your loss. That changed for me. So now if I see somebody that loses somebody and if it's a, even a distant friend for me now, I reach out. Right. Even just to say, yes. sorry for your loss. May your mom rest in peace or whatever. Um, that changed for me. Just, just acknowledging. You, know, you don't have to go over and above. But for me, just acknowledging was a big part. And I think a, a big reason why, like I said, when I, when I finally met grief at that level, right. um, you said it earlier, you, you don't know what you don't know. And, you know, I can't be upset at anybody for, for any of that stuff, um, which we're going to talk about later, kind of some of what, well, what you and I'll call the do's and don'ts maybe yeah. or some of the experiences that we've had. But at the end of the day, grief is not, uh, it's, uh, it's not fixable. No. The loss of Jackson and the yeah. loss of Luke are yeah. not fixable. Yeah. And we live in this world or this culture where we just need to fix everything. Yeah. And we can't fix this. Yeah. This is it. And I'm not trying to sound harsh or blunt or insensitive, yep. but what I've realized about grief is that it's what you've said earlier. This is not going away. Mm -hmm. It is here forever. Um, but people do want to fix us and they yeah. want to fix our situation yep. or they want us to be fixed or they want our situation to yep. be fixed. And and what I've realized is that this is for me personally, it's a chronic it's a, it's like a chronic physical pain. Yeah, it's never leaving, no. ever. It no. is always there. If if I'm not doing something um, where I'm busy or mm -hmm. distracted, because I do believe there's a difference. Yeah. If I'm not doing that, <clears throat> Luke is on my mind all the time. Yep. The grief is relentless. The pressure is relentless. Yeah. And so, like a chronic physical pain. Um, I heard a song. I don't even. I, I don't even remember the 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 name of the song. But essentially, it says the only cure for the pain is the pain. Yeah. And you have to learn how to live with it. Yeah. You have to adapt your life around it. Yeah. You literally have to change the way you live your life to accommodate the grief because it's not leaving. And and I feel like okay. So there's a couple of things that I. Terms that I don't like, getting over things. Right. Like we'll never get over things, right? So we talk about getting through things. Yeah, we talk, we say uh, moving forward. Moving forward, not, not moving, moving on. on. Yeah. So there's there's certain things. And so I liken that to um, <clears throat> we're, we're never going to be whole again. Right. But what we do do is we sludge through it. Yeah. Whatever it is, let's say we're going through mud. Yeah, it's muddy water. Uh, so it's, it's not even muddy water, it's we're, mud. We're never going to get to the nice dry stuff that we used to have where we're jogging on the streets. We're we're just always going to have this mud. Yeah. And we could sit there and sink in the mud and just be, woe is me. But we don't. We put our freaking gumboots on and yeah. we just keep sloshing. Yeah. And we just keep getting through. Yeah. And moving forward. We don't move on. We move forward. We never get over. We go through. Right. And there's there's things like that that, for me, are, are just different for us now. And uh, we'll never be the person that we used to be. Right. That's not necessarily bad in my mind because I'm a much more sensitive person than I used to be. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be a little bit hardened. Not hard, but, you know, like kind of didn't really give a shit about a lot of stuff. And, uh, so now I'm a much more sensitive person, which is good and bad because I'm too sensitive sometimes too. Um, but there are certain things that just fundamentally change in you forever. And i I knew the moment I lost my son that I was going to be a different person. I just didn't know who that person was going to be. Right. And. I'm getting a better picture of who that person is, but I'm still learning every right. day. And it's not a bad thing. I got to stress to people that that's not a bad thing. Um, but you're never going to be who you used to be. 
Yeah, we're changed. Yeah. We're changed. And, yeah. and, and I would suggest all of us are changed as far as the ripple effect of, yeah. of these losses. Yeah. Um, I heard this somewhere. I, I wish that I, you know, could remember all the things that I've heard or that I've read or and, and give, you know, citations and make sure that I'm saying who said it, but I, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but it talked about one of the greatest losses. And, and this is true for me and Luke. And I, th- I think it would be true for you and Jackson. The loss of the exchange of love. Yeah. So for me, <clears throat> it's that Luke and I don't have this exchange anymore yep. of love. And that's everything for me from the way he'd run up the stairs. He'd have one AirPod in, one out. You go, hey, Dad. Yeah. And he'd open up <laughs> the fridge. And I usually make him give me a hug. Mm-hmm. And then I just kiss him on the neck, and he would always yep. put his head right on my shoulder. And that exchange of love is, is devastating to me. Every day. Mm-hmm. And. There's so many more exchanges Mm -hmm. that I could talk about, but that is such a huge loss. And that's where I I think I struggle the most. And, um, you know, early on, I heard that the depth of your grief is the depth of your love. Mm Mm-hmm. So I guess I should feel lucky. Well, yeah. But yeah. I don't feel lucky, Chris. No. and But that's why it hurts more. If you didn't have that love, it wouldn't hurt as much. I know that Andrea always says, too, that uh, what we're mourning is the loss of the relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's everybody's relationship. So my Jackson had a different relationship with everybody. Right. And that's what that person mourns, you know, whether it was a a girlfriend or a buddy or a hockey coach or whatever it is. So they're all, they're all mourning the loss of that relationship because it's gone and all we're left with is memories. And, and to your point, you know, the depth of your love is equal to the depth of your pain. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you didn't love him, let's say it was a friend's friend, you'd have no pain. Right. You know, and there's also, I also read somewhere once that when you, when you love somebody, you give them a piece of your soul and they give you a piece of your soul. And when they're gone, that part of you is gone. Right. I think there's, there's so many things that... <sighs> that you know you lose i don't want to i don't want to say that it's cut and dry and this is how it is because it's so fluid and it's so different for everybody it's so different for everybody but uh we, we lost a part of us i had a reporter ask me um <laughs> he asked me a couple questions he said if you could do it all over again knowing what that this would happen again would you do it would you have a boy would you put him in hockey lessons hmm. would you tell him to go play junior hockey would you do all that again and it stunned me it i had to think about it because i wanted my i wanted my boy question. back i wanted my boy back at that point and i blurted out i, I just i didn't even think about it i sort of i'm like yeah i would because if I didn't, I wouldn't get those first 20 years with Jackson. Sure. It's the weirdest thing. Like, and I don't want to ask you either, but it's you know, something for people to think about that have lost somebody. Would you do it all over again? 
And my well, you answer... Can, you can ask me that question. Well, would and you? I, I would say that it depends on the day on my answer. Yeah. There's days that I've had. And again, knowing that, I, uh, you know, both of us are still early in our journey, but I'm just shy of two years. Yeah. Um, there's days that I would say no. Yeah. That if I knew the pain that I was going to go through, um, no. Yeah. But that's selfish. Now, well, that's, here's the other thing, though. Yes, I would do it all over again because of what I got to experience with my Lukey. Yeah. But that's selfish. That's the way I look at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, they're all right? selfish. They're all selfish. Yeah. And it's a real tough question to ask because yeah. the pain is is just so brutal. I know. But then when we look back at, at our boys, you know, I struggle – I don't know if this has happened to you, Chris, but like I struggle even with memory sometimes. Yeah. I would say um, since Luke died, I, I, there's almost a decade where there's things that I don't even remember. And I don't know what that's all about. I need to look into it. Like I, a Luke decade or a previous? A Luke to, decade. Really? A Luke decade. Almost, you know, Luke died when he was 16 and a half years old. And yeah. to me, it's almost like, and I have memories of yeah. of him and and our lives, not just him, but our lives in that yeah. time. But I have way more memories of him, kind of six and under. Yeah, and the boys. Um, but and I mean, it's not just Luke. It's 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 a TV show. Where I'm like, did I watch that? Yeah, series, and then I'll watch it, and I'll have no recollection of watching uh, whatever Breaking Bad. Yeah, and I'm like, I do not remember any of this. Yeah, which is just weird to me. And I wonder if that's my trauma yeah, because well, there is trauma that we've gone through. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I got to check. I don't even know what I'm talking about that, but I got to check into that. We can't beat grief. Nope. But I'm trying to take the attitude of I can't let grief beat me. Yeah, that's healthy. That's good. It's super hard though. It is hard. Because if grief beats you, then you break down and you don't function anymore. Right. But you're not beating grief. So you just have to learn to live with grief. Um, one of the things that we found is, and this was through a lot of our counseling is that, okay, what I was always worried that I was going to forget Jackson. Mm -hmm. I look back at a back to the future movie when Marty McFly has a family photo and he starts to slowly disappear from yeah. the photo. Yeah. And I had this image that Jackson's image is going to start disappearing from our photos that I was going to forget about him. My counselors kept saying, you're not losing. You're not forgetting Jackson. You're just learning how to get through the day so that your grief doesn't debilitate you. Mm. So, I mean, hell, we got so good at having a breakdown and picking up fast. Like, I remember one time, and we're probably uh, a month in or a month after Jackson died. Um, I was running late for whatever. I had to go have a shower, and we had to get out the door. And... I think we had company over before the shower. We had to kick the company out. I had to have a quick shower and I had to get out the door. So all morning we were entertaining. Then I had to have a shower, get out the door. I had a two minute shower where I bawled like a baby in the shower. Nobody knew. And I toweled off, dried off, did my hair and got out the door. Five minutes later, good to go and that to me was like a lesson in how i can still have my moments where i break down yep and then i put on my happy face and keep living mm -hmm. and we've had so many moments like that andrea and i both where you got to put on a brave face but i still gotta i, I need a breakdown i have to break down i, I gotta to. I got to have those moments where I'm selfishly grieving my son. Mm -hmm. You don't, don't freaking take that away from me. No, we have I to. I want that. Uh, you, you said 
you're you've been fearful of forgetting Jackson. We're we're like that too. Yeah. Um differently mm-hmm. the, the 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 way our boys died. Uh, not, and we're not comparing. Yeah. Um in some ways Luke's identity, I'm fearful, is a sad boy who took his own life. And I'm just going to say it, that that is what his identity is to, to many people. Yeah. But that's actually not who Luke was. Yeah. Luke was hilarious. Luke loved comedy. I like to say that was because of me, because I yeah. love comedy. He yeah. loved Will Ferrell. Yeah. That guy watched all nine seasons of The Office five times. Yeah. That was his claim to glory. Luke was... Uh, very athletic. Luke was very competitive. Luke was all these things. And sometimes Luke was a sad boy. Yep. But guess what? So are my other boys. Yeah, so are your kids. Yeah. So are, you know, all this. But we don't want people to forget Luke. Yeah. We don't want to forget Luke. We actually love it when we get messages or a card now mm-hmm. where they mention Luke's name. Yeah. It feels good. It does feel good. But yet, we still don't talk about him enough, even in our house, because we're still trying to grapple the con, the idea of what happened. How did this go down? Why did this happen? Who, you know, we blame ourselves. Mm-hmm. We do. It's and that's normal, natural. Um, rationally, we know it's not our fault. Yeah. Emotionally, impossible to not think that. We've had people say, "Well, no, you can't think that." I don't want to say, just F off. Don't tell me what I can or cannot think. Yeah, I'll think whatever right? I feel. Um, but, but that whole idea of not, for, you know, we don't want to forget them. Yeah. Because How? at the end of the day, and it's hard to say it this way, and I hope that, that this is not going to offend you, but Jackson is 20. Yeah. Luke is 16 and a half. Forever. Jeanette just brought up to me the other day that his 18th birthday was September 30th of last year. And now we don't know what markers to have for him. He would have graduated in 2022. That was a marker. He would have turned 18. That was a mark. We have no more markers now as far as what would his life have turned into. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult to think of that. And I think you're going to wonder that for the rest of your life. Forever, when you man. watch Luke's friends grow. Right. And get married and have kids and buy homes. and I mean, we watch our old kids do that. I know, but when you start seeing Luke's friends doing it, then it's going to hit. Like, I have Jackson's friends now. Some of them are married. Right. And I keep getting images of him getting married. Right. And having children. Where would he be? Where would he be living right now? Sure. He'd be, what would he, he look would, like? He would be 25 what, right now. What, what would all that? Yeah. Yeah. And where, what would he be doing for work? So there's always going to be that, you know, Kenny Chesney song, who'd you be today? Right. Um, you're always going to wonder that. And it's hard when their friends start hitting milestones and you don't because Luke's always going to be 16. Mm-hmm. That's, that's hard. Um, yeah, I, you mentioned that, uh, you don't want people to remember Luke as a sad boy. One thing I found that we did, um, just to sort of keep him alive is we mentioned Jackson's name all the time. A lot of times joking, Jax would love this. Jax yeah. would hate that. Remember that time Jax did this. Uh, most of the time it's light, Yeah. but just saying his name for us. It helps. Sometimes it catches people off guard. Yep. But, uh, you know, I think just saying his name helps helps me. Um, I think we're starting to get there yeah. on our journey. Uh, for me personally, yeah. um, I'm not going to lie to you. I struggled with it Yeah. in the first year. Um, I struggle even still today with pictures, Yeah. Uh, videos. I still struggle with it. Um. And I, I, I just wonder if that is the, the, the suicide part. How um, would you feel today? Let's say Christmas just passed. You got a family Christmas card from a friend. Yeah. 
and that card was addressed to all five of you. Mm-hmm. How would you feel? I don't know. I don't know either, because it's I know I do know when cards are addressed to Chris, Andy, Taylor, and Brett. Now, it feels a little empty. Oh, one hundred percent feels shitty. And I know that Jackson isn't here, but I still identify as a family of five. Mm-hmm. You and I have talked about that. Yeah. Um, you, um, when I send you and Andy text messages, I always, and I said, I'll do this for the rest of our lives that we know each other. I will always end it with five hearts yeah. forever. Five. Yeah. And because we feel the same way. Yeah. Um, still well, hard, man. Well, and then on that topic too, since we're talking about it is, you get you meet somebody new, and they're like, "Hey, tell me about yourself. Mm. How many kids you got?" <laughs> You're like, "Fuck you." Yeah, you know. So and, I, and you know what I think. Uh, this is maybe a good time to take a breather. Yeah, because let's bring that up in the second half sure. of this podcast because I've had a couple interesting situations like that. Sure, um, and I think what we can do in the in the in the second part of this if people are still willing to listen um, is we can talk about a thing that my wife read about and taught me around grief, illiteracy and grief literacy. And what does that even mean? Um, And I'm no expert, but I think we can talk about that. My hope is that this first hour and however long we talked, um, it's been sad. It's been some sad stuff, but my, my hope is that, this gives some people an understanding of what this looks like, um, even from a dad's point of view, um, from 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 a man's point of view. I guess there's 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 not a lot of men. There's there's are some, but there's not yep. a lot of men that are out there talking about it. And I think both of our hope and Chris jump in any time is that if people are listening to this, uh, my key message to this this side of this episode is that um, you feel you're going to feel so lonely in mm-hmm. your grief, but I promise you, if you choose to bring somebody into your life, who's experienced it. Um, unfortunately, Chris and I have each other because of what's happened in our lives, but go to a group. If you want to try it, definitely go to counseling. Yeah. Um, all these things that I think have helped us. Um, I actually haven't tried the group thing yet. and yeah. I'm, I'm going to, I might, but you and I, these are the richest conversations I have. The most honest, the most sincere, the most helpful. Um, never once has it been harmful. And my hope is that when people listen to this, they're going to go, okay, so I don't have to be alone. Yeah. And you don't. Uh, you also don't want to reach out to everybody that has similar experiences. Right. You can get wrapped up in the grief. Right. Um, but if somebody has experienced loss um, and you feel like you need some counseling, you need someone to talk to, then you have to get it because mm-hmm. you can't you can't go it alone. No. Because you just, for whatever, however we all react, uh, you will either beat yourself up You will drink too much. You'll do whatever it takes. And until you understand that what you're feeling is kind of normal, then you're going to feel like, you know, you're just, you're, you're, I don't know, different than everybody else. But really, Mm -hmm. there's so many similarities in grief. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter how you lost somebody. Um, We've all got a lot of similarities. So just (laughs) deal with, deal with that and get some help. And then I think that's... uh, and at the end of the day, um, it, it doesn't matter who you are. Every single person is going to deal with grief. Yep. And this isn't something that we talk about as a society. No. Because who wants to talk about that? Yeah. Like, it's not like there's a class that says, let's prepare you for losing a child or yep. a parent or a sibling or whoever. Yeah. And who, who would want to take that class? Yeah. Right. But that's part of life. 
It's part of life, though. <laughs> and we're all going to get there. We're all going to get there. But I think losing a child is just at this different level because it's the it's, unnatural order yeah. of things. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You lost but, your father yeah. uh, in the last... I lost my mother last yeah. year. And listen, my mom, huge... Inf- I love her so much. Yeah. I don't even know if I've started to process her death. I know. Yeah. I When, when I lost my dad in June... Uh, part of me, obviously I miss my dad yep. so much, but part of me was kind of, I was happy for him that he got to go out quickly, never a drain on anybody like that kind of thing. Right? right. And he was almost 80 and he just dropped from a heart attack. Um, but yeah, in my own selfish way, my losing my dad has just reignited all my pain from Jackson. Yeah. Like literally for me, that's yeah. everything. It, it brought and, up that loss yeah. more intensely. Maybe I've asked and and it, again, I don't, you, we don't want to compare cause that's no. not fair, but Andrea has a twin sister mm-hmm. and I asked her what it would be like comparing losing her twin sister, who is her, you know, her soulmate really. They think alike. They, they act alike. They freaking share a brain. Sure. And uh, I said, what would that be like? And she said, well, first of all, that's a terrible question to even think about. But she goes, not even close. Not even close. So, yeah. It can't be. Losing a child's tough. It's the greatest loss that we've ever experienced. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to read a little thing here if I can read it. And I think what we'll do, if you're okay with this, we'll kind of end this and... and, uh, And, and then we'll we'll come back in a bit. Um, this is my take on on my journey right now, <clears throat> and it's just that at times we have to choose um, to live and to love. There's times I don't want to, uh, where you just want to lie in bed, <laughs> you just kind of want to give up because life is hard. Um, and this isn't to me about suck it up, toughen up, especially for us, man, be a man, take care of your family, all that type of stuff. Um, it really is this idea that in order for us to function and to survive and to move through the mud and to move forward, I believe that we do have choices to make. I do. I believe that we can choose um, I'm not going to read this thing. We can choose. There's choices. There's different vices. Oh, yeah. Or we can just choose to go through it, yep. like you said. Yep. And I believe that's what you're doing. Yeah. I believe that that's what I'm doing. Or We're, we're trying. Yeah. And... um I think that you and I are also the type of people where we don't expect people to feel sorry for us. Yeah. But at the end of the day, people will. And you know what? That's okay because in some yeah. ways they should. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we keep saying we're going to take a break. Let's take Let's a take, break. Take a break. Um, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Relentless Podcast. And uh, yeah, we're going to have a, a, another chat with Chris on the next episode. So uh, thanks for, so far, the conversation that we've had, Chris. Thank you. I just wanted to put a little note onto this podcast, um, the two episodes for Chris and I, where we actually say quite often that, you know, if you're listening, you're not alone. And we're not trying to be insensitive to anybody. Um, We fully understand that within grief, you are alone. And your heart, your mind, your thoughts, your feelings, your pain, it's yours. It's nobody else's. And even though we may be surrounded and you may be surrounded by people and you may be surrounded and we may be surrounded by people who have experienced the loss of a child or or great loss in our lives, we're still alone. And we want to acknowledge that. Um, We definitely want people to know that that, uh, we we see that we're alone in, in what we're dealing with. But, um, but we do hope that, that this podcast gives you some hope 
and that you're able to reach out to others so that you can have uh, more of a sense of, of being with others as you go through your pain.